Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Fundamentalists Podcast. My name is Elliot Morgan, and I'm here with one of my best friends in the whole world, Dr. Peter Rollins. He is a uh, guy, and I'm a guy, and this is a podcast where we talk about the possibility of life before death. Uh, in other words, what do you do with this whole situation that we're in called life? What is to even as any of us to say about any of it? To do? Who knows? And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, that was a very profound statement. Well I'm always done. just like, yeah. hey, and also why, you know? <laughs> um, Pete, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. This uh, is, we're still on schedule, and yes. we even, I haven't seen you in like a week week yeah. and a half yeah. or something. You were, you were in the, the, the mountains of L.A. I was in the hills of L.A. for a LA. little bit, yeah. surrounded by deer. The, yeah, I saw the, the little thing you sent mm-hmm. me. That's incredible. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah I love the, the me watching The Fundamentalist and then panning over and a deer just being like, what are you doing Staring in there? at you. <laughs> you know, there's this whole theory that if you get out into nature and you're surrounded by animals that it really puts things in perspective. It's total BS. Uh, yeah. So, no, it was <laughs> wonderful. Um, it was like birds and stuff. I saw a skunk at one point. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Did you know, Pete? This is since we're, we're just diving into this. Are you going to eat through some zoology? A little shit bit. Dying? I didn't know. Yeah. I was, we we're, you know, you're the, this place, this cabin, there was a little hot tub, which I was showing, showing you. It was a little wooden thing with water. It was real, real cool. I've never seen anything like it before. And it felt very rustic and it felt real nice and relaxing but sitting in it and i heard this like ch, 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 and i was like wonder what this is gonna be this is a creature and i looked down and it's a skunk and my goodness those are the cutest animals uh-huh. i've ever seen and this little dude was like not even a dude he, a little dude he was the size of like a full pillow and he had a big old tail beautiful like white stripe down and he's just waddling around, and he's so clumsy looking. And I was informed by my girlfriend that skunks have horrible eyesight, and that's why they bump into everything. <laughs> and I was like, I thought that was the funniest thing in the world to imagine that, first of all, they're cute as heck, and their one defense mechanism is that they like kind of inconvenience you with a spray if you get too close to them, <laughs> and they can't see anything. And I was like, how did these things survive? Yeah. For so long, and then I looked up skunks because I was very busy. They don't busy. taste good. That's Apparently, maybe they, they don't they... taste good, yeah. Oh, is that right? Uh, well, <laughs> it's it's because the spray that they spray in the animal's eyes will temporarily blind them. It's a mm. toxin, and I didn't know that. I thought it was just a bad-smelling spray. Yeah. This episode yeah. is about, about skunks. Uh, you chose it. Do oh, you yeah, want to intro it? Do you want to... Oh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'll do that. I'm excited. Um, I'm just going to keep talking and railroad the whole conversation yeah. and keep talking about skunks <laughs> and birds and critters. We might we might be going for a fundamentalist meeting in this place. Yes. Isn't that right? Um, we yeah. need to do a, a quick... It, it was one of those air, like those Airbnbs where it's like, I have to bring people here. Yeah. Other people have to see this. All of our friends have to come. It's probably which is just nice. You. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. That's, we got to do that. Yeah, the, the topic I suggested is my turn in our you know we take turns is the gaze the idea of the gaze in philosophy and in psychoanalysis um and it's because this also has real world use this kind of concept so i thought we could talk about that i could maybe talk a little bit what what, what the gaze is and then we could uh, take it from there. Yeah, because um, I'm very interested. I have some loose idea of what you're talking about. We've probably talked about it a little here and there yeah. uh, on this idea. But I'm sort of, I'm just like shocked right now at uh, the um, pliability of reality and the mm. way everything feels so surreal and so scripted and so like a simulation. And... It's be- it seems to be that things are becoming even more absurd, which I <laughs> wasn't, uh, you expect, I guess, but it just, I mean, this COVID thing with the president and the debates were an absolute train wreck that was just like, I don't get, I don't have a lot of embarrassment, but it was truly like, oh, this is, a, this is cringy and embarrassing. And then you get on Twitter and it seems like everybody has a, um, really hard and fast view Mm -hmm. and the exact same things are filtered through these different views and you can't shake anybody's opinion or prove anybody wrong or right because they're they're seeing everything through a particular 
gays, dare I say. Yeah. Is that anywhere in the ballpark of what you're talking about? Absolutely. And I, w- I would love to, as someone who watched the debate, um, eventually we, let's get to talk about how this might help us understand what's going on between the Democrats and the Republicans. So yeah, Great. the gays is... I'd love to find out what's going on between them. <laughs> I'll give you my hot take. They need to have think. sex. Yeah. I'm gonna, my I, favorite uh, tweet on the debate, by the way, was somebody got these two are clearly sleeping with each other. <laughs> that's <I> correct. <laughs> watching Trump, but oh, they're totally sleeping together. Uh, very good. <laughs> so gays. All right. Gays. What's, okay. What is this business? Right. So we tend to think that we enter into the world as an individual and then we are socialized into the world. So partly what our family does is they socialize us into the world. And this leads us generally to think that we freely participate in the world and we can remove ourselves from the world. That it's almost like the world's a swimming pool and we jump in and uh, swim around with everybody else. But we start at the side of the pool and then we jump into the social world. And I think that's a wrong ontology, right? What's better to say... It's a ontology. Wrong ontology. Theory of being. Uh, is that it's pro it's we actually start in the social and we arise out of it just like life arises out of being and consciousness arises out of life and self-consciousness out of consciousness it's kind of like we as an individual arise out of the social world and that means we're existentially entangled with it so there's a thing called the look, right? If I look at something, I think I'm separate from what I look at. I'm, I'm just looking at the world. Things are happening to me that, you know, um, I'm kind of apart from it. But the gaze is the notion that actually what I'm looking at m- is my unknown face. There is my desire is embedded in what I think is just happening. Man, I love I love when you're explaining something, and then right at the end, I it's I lost you mm. right there at the very. I was like, yeah, gay is we're part of it. No, we're oh now I don't. Oh I'm yeah. Confused. Well, it's kind of like I was talking to someone uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, Give me a good example of this, but it's like, you know, if you're in a certain type of relationship, and you always end up in certain types of relationships and you think, why am I always in this type of relationship? It's just the way it happens. I happen to meet someone who's like this. I happen to be in this kind of relationship that always seems to end in the same way. That's the look because you're just looking at your relationship. You're going, this is happening to me. The gaze is when you go, oh my goodness, I'm entangled in this. Mm. I think I'm replaying something from my past. What's going on here has, I'm involved in it. So it's even like if, you, if you've got a conservative religious person who gives it all up and then they go online and they start attacking conservative religious people all the time, they think that they're attacking something that's outside of them, something that's out there. But what you generally find is they're attacking some part of themselves that they see externalized in this person. They haven't come to terms. So they kind of hate that religious part of themselves. So that's yeah. the case. You encounter yourself weirdly in what you think you're not a part of. That's, so when you're caught by the gaze, it's always traumatic because basically you catch sight of your own desire and you're freaked out by it. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, the, um, it also has that connotation when you, the dude who, the, uh, le- I left the like, uh, con- you know, conservative Christian used to be that, and now I go after them and I ridicule them, and I I am a proud quote atheist or whatever they they ascribe to. There's also a weird undercurrent of like, still I am now evolved from you, and therefore you are beneath me on the hierarchy of quali- of quality beliefs. I now believe something that is better than what you believe and therefore da 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 but it's still going, I am above you. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 absolutely. And this is the thing, is like either you're you're getting something from that, which we all do, oh, or fun. you're you're attacking something in yourself through the other. So like whatever you're fascinated by, the kind of the idea is like if you're fascinated by certain products or certain people, even if you hate them, if you hate a certain thing, there's there's something of your desire and yourself that is in that. So you're basically, but you don't feel that. Like our natural inclination is when you despise something, it's because it's separate from you. You think it's terrible. Not that, oh, that's 
there's something of my desire and fascination that is in that attack. Yeah. So the gaze is really the, the psychoanalytic name for when you realize that you're entangled with the problems that you think are just happening to you. Like that your desire and your traumas and your past are being replayed in the present. So you're not, you're not just a passive, a, a passive participant in the world that you love and hate. You're actually actively part of the world that you love and hate. It's wonderful because isn't it, I mean, it's a lot of, um, it's like a puppet show. It's like you are, you know, you got, um, you're upset with your mom and your mom growing up was really overbearing and really strict and, and, and mean. And now you get into uh, relationships over and over again where you don't, you're not treated very well. And it's just like women are just, they're so like, they just are so mean to me and they just like, they're so dogmatic against me. And really it's just a puppet show. They're just, it's the puppet for the mom and the- That's it. The, so yeah. yeah, so in psychoanalysis, that very person- <laughs> I got one. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you were, if that was you and you were in psychoanalysis and you were sharing that, and then the analyst, for example, just said one thing, just said, oh yeah, it's kind of like your relationship with your mom. And then suddenly you go, oh, it's not that I just happen to always meet a type of woman who is like that. It's that I look for them. And actually, even if they're not like that, I, I push them until they are. So there, there's a joke that um, Alanka, there's a philosopher called Alanka Sapanchik, and she uses this book, or this joke in her book. And it's not a very funny joke, but it's a very mm -hmm. insightful no, one. Philosophers don't do good yeah, jokes. Yeah, we don't do good jokes, cheap jokes. Some comedians don't either. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically the story is this guy comes home after a day's work and sits down and says, turns on the TV, there's adverts, and he says to his wife, get me a beer before it starts. And she was like, oh, gets him a beer, gives him a, he drinks it down, the adverts like are still dick. on. What's that? He sounds kind of like a dick. Yeah, well, it gets worse because he's like, he drinks the beer and he says, get me another beer before it starts. And she rolls her eye, she gets him another beer and the adverts are still on the TV. And then he says, get me another beer before it starts. And then she shouts at him and says, what do you think I am? You're skivvy, you go and get your own beer. And then he says, oh, it started, right? So the idea is that he's saying, give me a beer before you start to shout at me as if he's just going to be Egging. passively Egging. observing it. Yes, but he's actually invested and engaged in creating the activity that he thinks he's simply observing. So that's the psychoanalytic insight, is that we think we're observing things in our, in our world, and then we get the traumatic insight that we are actually provoking, inciting, agitating the very behavior that we think we're simply passively observing. Yeah. And the, and the reason why that's so important in psychoanalysis is it's the idea that if you don't know your history, you're condemned to repeat it. Like, you kind of have to get a sense of seeing yourself in the activities you're engaged in in order to begin to change them. If you don't know, you're going to continue to repeat your trauma um, and you're going you're gonna to continue to think that you're a passive uh, passenger in it rather than somehow in invested in it in some complex way i'm trying to word this in a right way because in my experience this uh you know and in, in doing therapy and having so much fun to mm. explore all this stuff uh but after a while it can be like i'll get um a little high on my horse and i'll be like i got this figured out like i kind of know i'm not going to do that thing again uh, that yeah. i normally <laughs> do and I did it like two weeks ago and I was like, oops. And uh, my therapist was like, told him his whole story, you know, and he's like, I'm gonna tell you something. And the moment he says that, I'm like, I don't know, I'm not gonna like this, whatever this is, it's gonna be some kind of bull crap, tough love. And he was like, you have a tendency to shoot from the hip a little bit. And you have a tendency to just shoot first, ask questions later. Uh -huh. And uh, he's like, this is a uh, pattern and he was like, you've done it here, 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 and here. And he was like, I don't know what this was like when you were in your 20s, but it sounds like this was the same thing. And I was like, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that thing where you've been paying attention to what I've been saying every <laughs> yes. hour. And you now, you now have the ammo to throw at me. Yeah. But um, it was also in line with, I had a um, this, this, this two week ago uh, little explosion. I had a dream 
um, about it beforehand, and I had a uh, uh, very, very startling dream. And I, I've discovered that I tend to have one particular type of recurring dream now, which is a plane crash dream. I have had so many plane crash dreams. Mm. I'm pretty sure that if I ever go down in a plane crash, um, I'm going to be like, all right. Like yeah, I kind of, I knew I've, this was I've done this so many, <laughs> dude. In, God was trying to tell me, don't get on a plane. In my I yeah, it. <laughs> in my yeah, in my dream, I was uh, as the plane started going down, the whole roof of the plane ripped off, and it, I, the plane, uh, which for some reason I always just like, even on planes when I'm flying, I don't have a fear of flying, but I always like, the only thing I never want to feel is the plane stop all of the sudden like just and i always imagine it could just stop and flip over or something and that happened in the dream the roof ripped off and even as it was happening in the dream i went "Ugh, this happens every time <laughs> i don't know what that's about like i was so even in my dream version of me it was like every time the yeah. plane just crashes and it was looking back on the dream and what had proceeded in the dream it was very clear that it was like exactly that kind of thing it was the exact same thing that the therapist was talking about about shooting first and ask question, questions later being like all right i'm gonna do this i'm so sure i'm so sure of what my decision is and i'm so sure of what my actions are and here we go um and then of yeah. course the plane going down and everything everything kind of exploding not to any kind of literal sense but um yeah it's fascinating yeah. it's like all this stuff those types of things and knowing your history and then being able to kind of see the patterns I think can also be aided by things like dreams and things that are just being like, Hey, here's the situation. Yeah. Here's another way of looking at the situation, which is very fun. The, absolutely. And, and what, what the analyst is doing, which is one of the bread and butters of an analysis is, you know, you might think that, right. You shoot from the hip occasionally cause you have to or whatever. Hey. But then when you suddenly go, Oh no, this is something I've done multiple times in my life. Sucks. So it's not just a situation. So if, if any, the moment that someone says, why does this always happen to me? Especially then, in the dream. All right. What's that? In the dream. Oh, you actually said that. Yeah, that's it, right. Tr like, I, I swear, just, <laughs> in the dream, I like, this always happens. It's, yeah. As soon as, yeah. I'm flying. I remember the feeling <laughs> of the wind in my hair. And I remember being like, Ugh, every time. <laughs> every time. Wow. Well, even your dreams just... Even my dream person yeah. is a sarcastic asshole. Yeah. It's just like, of course this is. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of the gaze because as soon as you realize that pattern and you're like, oh, so this isn't just life always throws me situations where I have to shoot from the hip. It's that I, I look for that. I do that. And then, of course, the question is why? And we kind of look into that. But it, that's the gaze. That's your confrontation with, oh, I'm enmeshed in what's happening to me. It's not just that I'm up. So it's the opposite of what people think about psychoanalysis. Sometimes people think of psychoanalysis as you don't take responsibility. It's always someone else's fault, your parents or whatever. But this is almost saying you're always, re you're kind of responsible. There's, you're a hundred percent responsible yeah, there, there's for something, everything. Yeah. You, something of your yeah. desire is enmeshed because otherwise you'd walk away. So I, I have a friend who she was, she was in a situation where she had no money for um, a week. And uh, she was stuck in this place, no money. Uh, she didn't have m enough money to eat very much or anything. She could have at any point asked her friends, family, partner for help, and she didn't. And she stayed in this situation. And what came out afterwards was, it was because this was a replaying of something that was in her childhood. So in a weird sense, it was literally happening to her. She had this situation where she didn't have money for a week. She was stuck, but because she was replaying something from her past, she didn't see a way out. Yeah. She didn't see a way out, and there were, there were ways out. Um, and so it was like, oh, I, even though this is passively happening to me, there's something of a trauma that is being repeated that mm -hmm. I'm allowing You're to be repeated. Just doing it over and over. over. Yeah. That's all life is, is just to... When you're eight years old, something happens, and then you just keep mm. going through that play over and over. <laughs> just, yep, just do you it again. switch out the actors, again. but the script stays the same, baby. Yeah. yeah, it's very fascinating. Also, I mean, I'd be curious to know more about that, but, I mean, I was always broke when I was a child. I, I mean, when I, when I was seven, I went through whole years without any money at any all. Any money at all. So Just crazy. handouts once a week. Hand from your parents. Yeah, five you know, bucks it's a week. humiliating as well. Like, you know. Oh, it's degrading. Yeah. 
Yeah. That explains a lot, actually. <laughs> Allowances, yeah, there's a lot to explore there. Okay, so yeah. what does this have to do with, with um, our current situations and our debates and yeah. our politics? And our, unless you still have more to go. No, 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 I want to get into so Can I give you a theory and see what you think, right? Great. I'm going to say this as I want to, I want to do some caveats here. As someone who's outside of America, I've lived here for a while. I love living here, but no, I, I don't get involved in party politics. I'm not as uh, a supporter of the Democratic or Republican parties. Um, I do do politics in Northern Ireland. I was involved in peace and reconciliation, but not party politics. So, so here's an analysis. See what you think, because this is about the gears. This will this will come around to the gears. Right? All right. So, and this could get us cancelled. Heck the, yeah, man. Yeah. The, the good thing about this is Trimey. I'm going to piss everybody off. Right? Right. I'm going to piss everybody off. Oh, I'm very excited. So as not to piss anybody off, it's good to piss everybody off. Yeah. Right. So here, when I was watching it, and I was watching this back and forth between Trump and Biden, yeah. right, I was thinking, okay, what, what is the gaze? What's going on here? And here's a, here's a thought. Right? Oh. If you're a Republican, right, and the, we'll take the ex, an extreme subgroup of Republicans, but it kind of this idea dissipates in a diluted form among many, but you have a feeling that the existential threat to America is a kind of lysationist, a li type of, um, I've been drinking, lysationist, yeah, a type of hedonism and a type of, uh, no, so it comes on the I thought you were talking about the, the process by which a cell's skin bursts. Licentiousness, that's the word I'm okay. trying to say. I said it wrong. Licentious. We'll have to edit that out. I shouldn't be drinking Definitely. gin. Definitely. We're going to heavily um, edit this one. This is the one. <laughs> yeah. This is the one we really go through with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Um, so there is a sense, I think, for some that the existential threat to America is, um, and you'll hear the terms, obviously, um, uh, what's it? Sex, uh, sex trafficking, pedophilia, Satanism. Yeah, right? weird obsession, right? What's that? They, they they all got a weird obsession with that stuff. Yeah. Ain't that weird? Well, no. And the, here's my interest in it, right? So I and here this is where I go no for or against. I'm just going to analyze, and then I want you to oh, tell me. Oh yeah, get, go right? into cancel territory, and yeah. then throw your hands up. Sure, yeah. leave me out yeah. here. Because I can see what is being said. So for example, the pedophilia, um, it, it's basically the id. Right, Republicans see an explosion of the id, which is chaos and disorder. There's a certain concern that that the elites, and we're talking about corporate elites and uh, edu uh, entertainment elites, have a Any type of yeah, uh, yeah, but have a have a type of id. I.e., there's a um, we're talking about in terms of Satanism, it's just do what they will. Should be the whole law. So drugs. Um, just do pleasure. what you want. Pleasure, 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 pleasure. And also then the sex trafficking, pedophilia is, is again, pure it. Pure, these people are having sexual orgies. There's a whole mm -hmm. pile of this shit. No taboos. In Los Angeles. Yeah, Los Angeles, everyone's doing drugs. Everyone's having sex. They're pretending, whatever, but there's a certain chaos and disorder, and that's an existential threat, right? Now, for I love this. I love everything you're saying. So okay. that's fascinating. Right. That's so well, fun. you know what you're going to like about this is this almost sounds like a Jungian analysis, but you'll like, you know, so we can come into that. So I'm being very quiet about that. Yeah. There's the Republicans are afraid of a certain chaos and disorder or explosion of the id. That's an existential threat. Now then, the Democrats don't see that. So they find that humorous, right? They find that funny, the idea that there's a sex traffickers and, and this lysationness and this drugs and all of this kind of stuff that's going on. Now, they will say there's a little bit of it. They'll say, it's a, of course, there's, a, there's some pedophiles. Of course, there's some sex trafficking. Of course, there's some hedonism and, and love of chaos. But it's a few rotten apples. It's not a systemic hmm. issue. Okay. It's not an existential crisis. All right. Right. Here's the thought. I got a little, okay. Okay. Hmm. So in other words, yeah, Democrats, of course, are going to say... In the, in the protest, there will be some rioters who just want chaos, right? Of course, there's a few, but it's it's only a few bad apples, yes. right? Don't let that distract you from the message that the that, that yeah, people protests exactly. are saying, which is of exactly. great importance. Yeah. And of course, there are some like uh, people like, you know, who are corporate, who are just into drugs and sex and having a good time and whatever. And they'll say whatever they want just yeah. to be able to have a hedonistic lifestyle. Yeah, I don't right? do drugs. Yeah. I just every now and then have, yeah. I'll have a little something. Yes. But it's not an existential crisis. It's, uh, the jazz is... Uh, yeah, take the edge off. Take a little... Just to take the edge off. Yes, right. Now then... On the other side, I think there's a small group of Democrats, but this is also spreads more widely. They believe that the existential threat to America 
is in the form of a type of fascism and kind of neo-Nazi thing. Yes. So that the main organs of st the state are controlled largely by kind of neo-Nazi and fascists. And that's the existential threat to America. The existential threat is a type of fascism that would undermine democracy. Mm -hmm. And now the Republicans, they don't see that. Now, they will say, of course, there are some neo-Nazis. Of course, there are some fascists. Absolutely. Yes, of course, but, but there are a few, bad, a few yeah. bad apples. But we live in a democracy. We, the organs of state are democratically run. The you mm -hmm. know, Supreme Court will continue. Also, whatever. hey, yeah. Donald Trump had denounced white supremacy in the past. Yeah. Like, there's no reason yeah. for him to have to just do it over and over again yeah. because, like, who wants to do that, I guess? Yes. Well, <laughs> well but, no, but that's the issue. That's what yeah. I want to come to is in the debate is that, see, if you're a Republican you don't feel the need to denounce it because it's, you don't see it as the existential threat, right? Yes. You, right? So you great will say... Point. Yeah, this you, is great. Yeah. This is all great. Was okay? I right. stand by everything oh, you're saying. Oh, right? Okay, so, so this is just my kind of like outsider view on this, right? Is that, that if you're a Republican, you will say, yeah, of course I do, but you will immediately say, but that's not the existential threat. The existential threat is a licentiousness and is, is, is drugs, is pedophilia, is sexual impropriety, is the... the, the the, the, the existential threat to America is chaos and disorder. And then on the other side, you will, um, you will have trouble uh, saying the opposite, right? Because you'll go like, no, the, the, the existential threat to America is not um, disorder and chaos and this kind of hedonistic lifestyle. It's, um, it's law and order. It's actually, there's a fascism. So, in one sense, one side is afraid of chaos and disorder. The other side thinks that there's too much uh, kind of like totalitarian, totalitarian yeah. order. And then, then here's the trick, is I think each side has a repressed version. Yep, there it is. Oh, okay, you like this? Yeah. Okay, right. And this is the no, theory. Trump this is, is the representation of, of id, chaos. He yeah. Sleeps with hookers, he cheats, he's had abortions. He's paid more in abortions than he has in taxes. He is the absolute... Um, embodiment of all that they claim on the surface to, yes. to not like. Perfect. And then on the other side, my argument will be that you will find incredible totalitarianism arising around purity culture, council mm -hmm. culture. Sure. Yep. Da -da. So what happens is what you what the side that is afraid, the side that is attacking law and order, that will ra that will appear in unhealthy ways. The side that is a, that is afraid of chaos and disorder that will arise in unhealthy ways. So you end up with Republicans, you know, doing cocaine, having sex with rent boys, having orgies, boys, yeah. and then on the left you will have uh, uh, groups that have very, very kind of like a, a militaristic yep. organizations and all the that. Force or against us. No so this is this is my analysis. Of I what's love happening. it. And the re and, and you know where I think the existential crisis is. The existential crisis, I don't think, is in disorder and chaos or in law and order. I think the existential crisis that America faces is that these are two incommensurable worlds where if you're in one camp, you literally cannot understand the other camp and vice versa. And so what yep. will, and that's what the ego was called. So one is an explosion of id, the other is an explosion of superego. So superego is law and order, id is pure disorder and yep. chaos. And... Um, and uh, so the, Re the Republicans are the superego, the liberals are the id, but there's a repressed superego in the id of the, the, the Democrats, and there's a repressed id of the superego in the Republicans. Yes. When we, when we usher in chaos, just know that we did it smiling. Cannibals on this island, inmates run the asylum. That's a, a poem from Killer Mike of Run the Jewels. Uh, uh, but it's uh, the song Ooh La La that they did in 2019 or whatever, and the music video is weirdly... Um, relevant to today's situation. It, ha it was all filmed prior to the, the protests and stuff, but it's it's all very wonderful. Yeah, but the uh, I love all that stuff, man. I feel like everything I need to know about politics, I learned as a kid with the abortion debate. That's everything you need to know. The It is the perfect microcosm of how there is such a stalemate in the ability to communicate because anybody who is against abortion, I've never heard a single person being and the people who I know who are devoutly pro life are not sexist against uh, uh, women in mm -hmm. my experience, or at least they do not see that themselves that way. They see themselves mm -hmm. as fighting for the the rights of unborn children. The people on the left who are pro choice are like, oh no, you're against 
you're against women. And then the pro-life people on the right are like, you're against babies. You don't even like life. And it's like, you can't get anywhere with that argument. You know where I think you can unify everybody? Here's my theory. That if kids I was in suck. control, success, yeah. Well, my, my theory for how to unify people is you have a third person who goes, I believe that, that pe- people are people from conception, and I don't give a fuck, just kill them anyway. Because both <laughs> yeah. sides will agree that that person's an asshole. And yeah. then, and then you'll, you'll unify everybody on the hatred of the third. We need a scapegoat. <laughs> so there's, there's my solution. We have to set up. Maybe we should be that. That should be our political position. I know. Oh, yeah, definitely unborn fetuses are people. Yep. And we don't give a shit. I've heard that set. <laughs> oh, is that right? Like, <laughs> non-ironically oh, from, yeah. uh, from people on the left. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, we're just cool with that. And yeah. I'm like, all right, that's not... I thought that could, that could generally unify everybody on both sides. It's a fun as a joke, <laughs> but when you see someone sincerely say it, it's not a fun mm. uh, a yeah. fun argument. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's... The, uh, yeah. the communication, the, 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 the priorities, like, it, it does seem like it, it does go back to two general sort of outlooks like you're saying and one of them i can only imagine that this is somewhat uh paralleled in the majority of people's internal internal world right now where they are fighting between responsibility um orderness restraint and also the um all of the pleasures and fun that are uh, readily available to everyone or other people that they can't get their hands on like i do feel like all of this boils down to some strange uh thing in all of us that can't i wish there was some sort of worldview that would make sense of this like psychoanalysis yeah uh, yeah if only where, <laughs> where contradiction was at the heart of these things and you had to exist oh. within i don't know i don't know i'm spitballing but yeah. uh yeah i love everything you just said i oh. think it's it's great because in in my watching the debate for one it is so um is you know seeing trump behave the way he did was to me surprising honestly and that because i'm pretty i guess easily surprised but it was so almost basic. It was so sadly, um, he showed his hand right away. Like he showed his, in, in terms of the debate, he was like, this is my method. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna steamroll you. Mm-hmm. And he bullied, he was a little bit of a bully, which he always has been a bully, so you wouldn't expect him not to be. But then in watching it, I was like, this guy is, is acting in such a disgraceful way, and yet his supporters truly believe that they that they are representing a moral, conservative, orderly, peaceful like. I exist. think both sides are like both sides think there's an existential crisis. They do like now. Joe Biden doesn't represent that, you know, as strongly on the Democratic side. But I think both sides think there's an existential mm-hmm. crisis. Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 yeah, that's what you're seeing is that this is a. But uh, there's, a, I do think there's a difference between an existential crisis and being like. Ah, this is like a boogeyman that I made up in my head that is kind of the thing that I'm going to imagine is going to solve all of the problems if we get rid of it. But we do, I do think we have this climate change problem that is actually an existential like threat, like a oh. true, both existential and literal threat. And so, but even the left isn't even talking about it. Even the really, even they aren't trying to really do anything about it. So who knows? Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's, that's like, well, that, this is why I don't engage in party politics because to be honest both both parties are neoliberal and you know, there, there's not much difference there but but you're right that is a that is a, a real danger yeah. and and whoever gets in power i i hope that you know we kind of make uh we yeah. make positive changes i hope way. so i hope that um, someone just i just want so, uh someone to do something yeah. but uh but like i've got my ac running at the moment i'm sure that's environmentally terrible yeah um you yeah. know so uh, like uh well if we want to play the hypocrite game yeah <laughs> i'll win for yeah. sure but but you, you know, here's the interesting thing right, right in you, you mentioned psychoanalysis like in the very basic psychoanalytic model, you have id and superego, and that's that's kind of what I did here. Yeah. Is I kind of put id as in chaos and disorder. Not that that's a democratic party. That's the fear of the Republican Party. That's the gaze that they see. And then on the other side, superego, which is law and order. Mm-hmm. The ego is what erupts to manage the contradiction between id and superego. And so my hope. It's like I don't think I don't think um, 
I, I don't think whoever wins, I, you know, it, it, won't, it won't affect the contradiction. What we need is the rising of some group that become like the ego, that somehow are able to manage this, this incommensurable contradiction mm -hmm. that currently exists in America. And I don't see it yet. Andrew Yang. What's up? I mean, I, I like Andrew Yang. Um, oh, right. I like anyone who, who sounds like a human when they mm. talk and also is smart and seems like a good person. But um, it also might not be. I don't think it'll be in party pause, but I've got a feeling that might be something completely outside of everything. What do you mean? Oh, you mean like in an even bigger way? You mean I, think, I mean, I'm talking about an Apostle Paul. Whenever a Jew and Gentile are like so incommensurable worlds that mm -hmm. are impossible, and then you have this figure that comes in and creates a new language that allows for the enfolding of of the opposition. Mm -hmm. So, but I do think that that this this contradiction is going to collapse a certain way of doing politics. But does that mean so we need a new? That's why I'm trying to make a. I'm trying to produce a documentary on Tommy Faye Baker, mm -hmm. and the reason is because you're not trying. Yeah, yeah. What's that? You ain't trying. Well, yeah. You're making progress. We're well, making progress. Thank you. You know, and the idea is that she was we call it American contradiction. The idea being that she brought together people that you would never imagine being brought together. Uh, uh, yeah. People from the fundamentalist community, trans activists, gay, lesbian community bringing all of these kind of people that you would never imagine being together, all all unified around this Beautiful. contradiction. Beautiful. So and, I think we need a Tommy Faye for today. Undeniably lovely human. Like, I yeah. don't know how anyone could not just be like, just sit back and smile. Like, yeah. I don't know what political bent you'd have to have to not look at some a figure like Tammy Faye and be like, well, like yeah. if that's you, then you're you're a bad, and yeah. you gotta go because yeah. that is someone who uh, truly did bring so many people into the fold, yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it's such a cool. It, it, I love too that she was so, um, just so Christian, so steeped in that world yeah. that it, it it that she transcended. It's it's beautiful. It's beautiful, like, and she embedded all these contradictions. She was like religiously very conservative and yet completely open to to people's sexuality and and, mm -hmm. and and the completely small town innocent girl who was also a massive consumerist and like you know all of that she mm -hmm. was so authentic and yet you know wore this kind of almost like wore makeup of so much hiding and like so all of these contradictions never were get to me you'll never get to me yeah this, yeah this is so yeah, like, I love everyone, but I have a shield that's in the quarter inch thick makeup. Yeah, Very beautiful. Beautiful. Well, it's so she becomes, you know, like an, you know, a, a Jay Baker, who we both know is like one of my, like yourself, one of my best friends. Uh, um, yeah. Is uh, I wish Jay lived here. Yeah, he I know, I know. But like he, um, you know, I've got to know his mom, you know, and the memory is not through him. And I'm going like, she really caught all of these contradictions, and not not intellectually in her very being. Yeah. And that's stuff that, that, that so matters. She's, she's the apostle. She was a type of apostle Paul for her day, and I think we need we need a new Tammy Faye mm -hmm. for this moment. Um, a new and punk used to be that punk was that for Northern Ireland. Yeah. The, the punk bands provided an alternative between the uh, the Catholics and the Nationalists and the Protestants and the Unionists. Yeah. Punk was this contradiction that you didn't matter what you were, you could be punk. It provided a third way. Yeah, a third way too is I think is different than the um, compromise between mm. the two, which is yeah, that sort not, of yeah, like it's very different. Yeah, the libertarian or the um, green or whoever, yeah. where you're like, I'm third, and I'm this because I believe in this, but I also believe in that. It's like, yeah, no. right on, dude. Believe whatever you want to believe, but also like, you need someone who can be a big enough figure that they can literally contain all of it. Yes, and uh, we, I don't know of anyone who. Uh, who is that yeah. right now? Yeah, I do like certain uh, certain figures. I just, even though I may not um, align with their views, there are those that are out there. But there's no one loud enough right now. It's also it's such an unfortunate time because back in that day, it it did seem like there were just fewer famous people, and there were it was easier to kind of make a splash. And it's unfortunate that like with social media and stuff right now, everyone is famous. Everyone has, um, or or not everyone, but everyone 
there's so many. There's so many options. And how do you get yeah. someone who can be so big that they can contain all these things, but they can also have enough power to captivate huge, like everyone? Because it has to be mm-hmm. everyone. It's going to be a K-pop person. It's probably going to be K-pop. K-pop could is be, probably the be, one <laughs> yeah. uh, group that can do it, and yeah. they'll, they'll take over everything pretty yeah. soon. I mean, it'll either happen or it's the apocalypse. And but, but I funnily enough think it'll happen because I think basically what happens is enough of this tension arises and arises and arises until it basically almost someone is forced into that position. Like it's like, you know, Tammy Faye didn't choose to be mm-hmm. that, that contradiction. She just, society needed it. So I'm like, I'm interested to see what's going to ex- what's you going know to. You know what she exclude. chose? I mean, I mean, not chose to be that symbol, I would say, but she chose to be. She was consciously choosing to be, except uh, radically accepting of other lifestyles. That no, that's people. true. But I still don't think that that alone wouldn't be enough to make her the cultural icon that she mm-hmm. was. You know, like. But you're right. Like she, you know, she was making these choices, but almost it felt like. I think of it like the Titanic. You know, it was. It was, it's so famous even today. It's just a ship sinking. That's all it was, a ship sinking. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't. It was the congealment of the, you know, the ship Industrial ship's Revolution. Industrial baby. Revolution, yeah. The New end tech, of yep. European class kind of like, you know, uh, structure, the beginning of the war. It all, so it kind of became a, a symbol. So Tammy Faye made choices, but she also became something bigger. You know, it's like, what's so that beautiful. Batman line, you know, where you, say you become more than... Yeah, you, you either a uh, die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. Yeah, and she and it's, and she tragically she died, die but she tragically died. And that, that's the reason why people like Kurt Cobain and Heath Ledger and these figures sometimes mm-hmm. remain symbolic because they died, sadly, but they, they now become something symbolic. I also wonder if the reverse... Uh, happened as well, like where they became symbolic. They felt themselves becoming symbolic, and they felt the weight and the the size of what they were containing. At times, yeah. maybe overwhelms certain people, yes. which is a fun little thing to think about. Um, yeah, do you think? Right. And here's, a, I'm curious about what you will will, will say this because I have no, you know, you're you obviously uh, know so much more about Tammy and all that stuff, but like. Tammy Faye Baker was functioning as a partner to Jim. Yeah. And I I do wonder if the uh, contrast, the sort of having him as the almost grounding wire of everything allowed her in some way to also sort of be even more bombastic or accepting or radical. Um, yeah. And what would it have been like without that pairing a little bit with that ability without, without her being able to kind of have a yeah one foot still on the ground kind of deal yeah. which is interesting i mean it, it was a perfect storm i mean that's yeah the, that, that's where that's like, a great yeah. yeah it's a perfect storm and, and we need a perfect storm today and but it kind of will happen like there's enough to you know to try to extend the analogy bef- beyond credibility but there's enough storms in the world that one works what well, one brings everything together and you know so, they have a word for this Pete. what's that alchemy Alchemy. Well, yeah, the alchemy. If, if alchemy means that enough <laughs> if it chaos means this. happens. <laughs> Easy. Dude, yeah. I was, I've been watching a lot of this pottery show on Netflix, The Great Pottery Throwdown, and they do this whole thing with alchemy where they wrap the pots in, like, copper and hair and, like, whatever they can find, and then they put it in this really hot, like, 2,000-degree oven, and whatever happens, happens, and, they, and it becomes gold. Yeah, it makes different uh, patterns or whatever they call it. I don't even know. It just yeah. looks to me like they're exploding it a little bit. But um, yeah, that's good. Fun yeah, though. yeah. And alchemy is like that's almost like what psychoanalysis does. It takes your suffering and your pain and it puts it into such an intense heat that it becomes something like, beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Sublime. Yeah. Um, I also love one of the things I love the most about the, the word alchemy. Truly, I have absolutely no idea what it is i just know that it's i know how it's been described i know it's like this puts together with this which puts together with this and then something completely new arises so Mm -hmm. i know about it on a metaphorical level but i don't know growing up i always thought alchemy was like something with like mad scientists in labs who were like concocting witches brews or something i mean that's where like this is where the funny thing is all of the cool stuff originates from something mental and that's why (laughs) (laughs) that's why like people Tammy Faye. Yeah. (laughs) Because in philosophy, you kind of like, 
yes, if the first theories are always a bit crazy, but there's always some deep truth in them. So yeah, the first alchemists were trying to like literally change the elements through kind of crazy experimentation. But actually, there's a truth to that. We say we can change our suffering into something good. We can. There is a type of alchemy that we need. Yeah, I yeah. love it. But I thought you might like. I was wondering. This is why I wanted to do this 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 gears thing because I thought. You might like this analysis uh-huh. of the, the I love Republicans it. and the Democrats because it it plays into order order and chaos, id, superego, and repressed, and the return of the repressed. And uh, I mean, it's like a lit a, a, a perfect um, blueprint for the idea of a like repressed id or shadow or whatever. Yeah. You see, the Jungians Man. would go, "Oh, this is like anima animus. This is like uh, this is like the the unconscious as the uh, the uh, the right. the uh, the balancing of the conscious." The balance, so I, yes, the, yeah. the compensation. Obviously, I don't the, go for that shit. Sure, sure, but yeah. it's weird how it keeps happening. But <laughs> anyway, uh, no, but it it whatever word, it is so fascinating that the thing, the values, and the things that both sides are espousing do seem to i mean even like like one of my favorite type i think of of liberal left person is the uh is like a killer mike a run the jewels type of pair yeah. that they're fun they're you can't be listening to his al- i think i listened to one of his albums and it was very I, good i don't think i've hooked you yet though i haven't hooked, but, to hook but i did like it but i need to listen to more I yeah need, i don't listen to much music to be i honest, think so. they're they've changed my life i love them more than any but they have a sense of humor about themselves they are um so like a little anarchist and a little like whatever with all that stuff but then you look at like the nominee for the Democratic Party and a lot of current Democrats that are in power, and you're like, ah, like it's not, like that's not that, you know? Like I like that version of of left, le- liberal Democrat. Like I like the ones that are like, yeah, sometimes we get drunk and we do drugs, and sometimes we we party a little bit too hard, mm-hmm. and sometimes we even know we're being a little hypocritical in what we're saying, and hey you know what, you're welcome to the party. What, like, I love all that mm-hmm. stuff. Like, everything's a go. And then you kind of see this representation of it politically that is so stripped of what I think is really appealing about the left, which I'm discovering in real time, I guess, which is sort of a fun, accepting, like, vibrancy to it. It's totally gone when you see these people on TV. When you, Nancy Pelosi starts spouting off whatever it is, I'm like, okay, I'm like, I guess, great, whatever, you're doing your thing, but it doesn't capture what it is. The same thing with the Republican Party where they're like, we believe in this, we believe in this, and we're very, we're family values, and your guy that's public, your mascot, is the opposite of all yeah. of those things. It just, see, it's so, it, like, once you see it, you really, like, I, I like the way you, you, you saw it immediately. It's like, because the idea is, if, if, the, if the Republican Party are the, the party of the superego law and order, then it's obvious as well when you look that it's it's the the repressed is they're having a blast they're doing drugs and sex and having a blast like you know Trump is having sex with he was with Playboy models in his time all that Adderall's then, flying out of his nose yeah and then you look at the <laughs> Democrats and you go they're they're a party that um, you know wants to kind of have more openness about kind of various things and yet you see a certain kind of militarism in terms of cancel culture and, and whatnot arising and so you, you see you, you just see that the what's freud called it the repressed and the return of the repressed that as soon as you repress the repressed returns in an obvious way that is also invisible so you it's weirdly you don't see it and yet it's everywhere yeah i don't yeah. think i've until this very moment put together the mm. What bothers me so much, I mean, I had this thought, which is an inappropriate, you know, when you have to like burp out a joke, like it's got to get out of your system, but there it is, there goes a burp. But um, I, uh, with this whole president getting COVID or whatever, my, I had this thought where I was like, this is not, I, this is just a joke and I'm not, I don't espouse this, not looking for laughs here or approval. But um, if you're looking for laughs, man, you're sorely oh, disappointed. God, tell me. <laughs> this year, uh, but it was like uh, my thought was the, the left is so bad at winning that they needed coronavirus to help a little uh, bit, which is not appropriate and it's very offensive. Whatever, you burp it out, uh huh, get it out of your system. But um, I look at the left sometimes and I'm like, 
you're boring. And then I go listen to Run the Jewels, and I get, you know, and I listen to people, speakers, and like people who are doing writing and really good writing on the subjects that I'm interested in, and political commentators. And I'm like, this is all really cool. Why are the politicians so like? There's nothing to. There's nothing to them. There's yeah. no. There's no interest. It's so boring. It's so boring. Yeah. No wonder they're not getting votes because of, you're boring. Yeah. And isn't it funny, right? That if you if you look at the the Democrats, and I'm avoiding right and left because you know I'm a leftist but not a Democrat, <clears throat> and so I don't like to use the word left or any of this. But um, the Democrats, in one sense, are pr- all pro sex work, trans rights, gay rights, all of this stuff. But you kind of get the feeling there that it is, it's yeah. all a bit boring and you have to make sure you say the right thing. Whereas the conservatives all seem to be law and order about this right and wrong and what's good and bad. But you kind of get the feeling they're having the best but sex. Okay, yeah. Right? You're kind of well, having the Well, I don't big, know about that. Well, I don't know, man. Honestly, I, I would say that you know, so like the, that's why that's why there's always more um, uh, what's the word? Uh, scandals on the right, you know, where you yeah. find out that this person uh, has been like you know injecting heroin into his eyeball mm-hmm. and doing all this stuff. So oh, it's it's not a hundred percent, but it is just funny when you start to look at it. You start to go, oh yeah, that that the gaze is that the very thing that you're attacking. So for example, if you're if you're Republican and you're attacking the, and I, I can't say the word right. This is brilliant. I've said the word wrong every single time licentiousness i thought you were saying i can't say the word right <laughs> okay like right. i can't like you didn't even law want to say order. the word i don't want to say right, law and order conservative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah that's right no um i can't say the word a uh, stand stand by stand back stand by uh, uh, uh i've been tripping over licentiousness so much th- um yeah. oh god yeah because that's a crazy word but uh did you did you watch the clip of him saying stand by Oh yeah, stand, yeah, stand by him. That was a weird moment, man. Yeah, yeah. That was weird. Well, he, this is the, even this the way he said it was like so strange. Like yeah. it was like a computer program took over his his face for a second because he's like he. It's like his brain wanted to tell them to, to you know denounce, yeah. stand down, or whatever. But it just came out, and yeah. it was like everyone was like, Voomp. I know, got you. I honestly think there is a sense in which both sides find it hard to acknowledge the big other of the other side so i so i mean proud boys is another is another thing we could talk about that proud boys are that's, that's an interesting topic i know because yeah, that's a whole thing where i'm like don't even bring them up they don't deserve the pr it's just a bunch of dorks being trolls and then they became whatever they it's are kind of, yeah they started off as a truly yeah. kind of bunch um but yeah like in the same way that trump found it hard because he literally doesn't think that the the fascism is an existential crisis Biden doesn't think that um, this type of like uh, hedonism and kind of like this type of like uh, is, is the destruction is an existential mm-hmm. crisis. So both sides do want to kind of give ground, and they should probably just like if you're go talking home. to they should probably go home. You could go home maybe, but if you're talking to someone who suffers from paranoia, you generally have to enter into the, their paranoid delusion to some extent in order to change it. So both sides should enter into the paranoid delusion of the other side in order to be able to shift it. So th- I think both sides have kind of like not, I don't think they're getting good enough advice. I should be a political advisor. Come yeah. on, that would be good pay. Do they get paid well? You, you, there should be advisors that are not, that are not political advisors. Yeah. They should, like in the olden but days. But I don't want to be in the service of evil. Sure, like, like you don't want to be in the service uh, of people? Nepo- evil. Mm. evil <laughs> people i hear what i want to hear yeah that's a freudian here uh, <laughs> yeah uh they should like in the olden days <clears throat> just bring in damn it someone who's smart to talk to people <laughs> like you don't have you could walk in and be like have you guys ever thought that maybe you're sort of a representation of all that you don't stand for and just see what happens oh, yeah, see. it couldn't hurt <laughs> maybe just yeah. you just walk in dressed in a full mirror and be like this is the problem yeah. do you see the problem yeah but yeah, no, but I think I'm like, when I was watching it, I was like, just enter into the gaze of the other and then, and then you'll be able to kind of, you'll be able to kind of manipulate it in a good way, you know, change it. But neither, neither find it easy to do that. And I can understand why, because they don't want to, they don't even see the existential threat. That That's the incommensurable world thing is like, that you're, we're not even in the same, there's no neutral ground 
upon which they see the world in a similar way and disagree, they literally see the world in fundamentally different ways, yeah. which means that they're not even speaking in some mm -hmm. respects the same language. Not at all. That's what yeah. it comes back to. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. really aren't. Um, and um, yeah, and, and that for me is the existential crisis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And because it, 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 it will explode. Mm -hmm. There's no way it can't. Keep, it's an unstoppable force, a movable object type yeah. of situation. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, I but what was I thinking? I had a thought about something. God knows what it could have been. I'm sure it was good. Oh my God! Sure Can you even good. imagine? <laughs> it was gonna be crazy. Uh, Somebody did give us like a one star review and said that we sound like two kind of like people on weed just doing I reckons. I reckon this. I reckon that. That's the podcast. Yeah. That's the podcast. So I think that's that, that's, that should have been a five star review. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you could tell me that was. You'd say the exact same thing with five stars, and I'd be like, "You're welcome." Yep. Absolutely. Thank you <laughs> very uh, much, sir. <laughs> But surprisingly, lack of weed. We just have a yeah, with no no weed um, at the moment. But um, yeah. what was I gonna say? Yeah, it was something. Uh, oh yeah, I used to just think that like the whole political thing was this really complex game of chess. But in order to play chess, you know, board right here. My understanding is that you have to... As someone who's only ever played drafts. Basically. <laughs> uh, you have to enter into the mindset of what your opponent is going to do. You have to imagine that you're the opponent mm -hmm. and what you're, they're going to do. And mm -hmm. then what you're going to do. And then what they're going to do because of what you think you're going to do because of what you think they're going to do. Right now, it's just a screaming fit. Like, yeah. the politics, there's no... It's like, it's not even engaging really from my from what i can tell on any kind of clever level which is what i think is is happening some with some sects right now of pl politics on both sides that are like they're going to do this and they're going to do this and then this is going to happen and they have this grand plan and i he hear both sides doing that and i'm like watch that debate and, and honestly tell me that there's some grand plan on either side because neither of them even are interested in winning the game of chess through strategy, through through um, achieving anything, it's literally scream, response, scream, response. Like it's crazy. Yeah, I know. And the and the thing that is very scary to to know and to think is in relation to the gears is that the very thing that you're fighting against, you're sustaining. So, for example, money has no value except that we all believe it has value, right? Money only has value because we all believe it does. If you if everyone stopped believing that money had value, like coins and paper it would be a disaster because the whole society would fall apart. Our belief in it sustains it. And so on made all it sides, what's that? We made it up. We made it up. So on all sides, sometimes the thing you're fighting against is what sustains it. That the most radical political move, and Shizak talks about this, it, it's called, he calls it the, I would prefer not to, but it's the moment when not. you stop believing in it. So, for example, when you start, you just literally no longer love something or hate it. You simply detach from it. Now, as an individual, that's not enough. But if there's thousands of people and tens of thousands <laughs> detaching, like, and that's so that's the fall of like regimes like the Soviet Union, it was simply not because of force. It was because there was a certain point where nobody believed in it anymore. Yeah. It's like, eh. And then, and then, and then the whole structure that seemed so. Um, it seems like it's apart from you and it, it's as real as that bookshelf. And then you realize, no, it's only as real as the bookshelf because we give it reality. Mm -hmm. So the terrifying thing about the gays is what if both sides are sustaining the very thing that they're attacking through their libidinal investment in it? And that actually what we need is some, is some movement to come up that 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 utterly changes the very coordinates of the debate yeah i know i get something out of all these these dramas and these headlines and and everything that's just very libidinal i guess is the perfect word because it's mm. just like it feels so good and yeah like oh did you hear about this let's uh this is mm. crazy did you hear about this we're about oh he's got covid now when oh, he did it in 10 days ago he was saying this oh my god oh my goodness yeah. can you even believe it da, 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 da. and you're like i could just ignore all of this but i do it because not because I think I'm right and I'm I'm appalled on a moral or ethical level. It's not like I'm grasping at my pearls. On some level, I'm going, give me it, give me yeah. something to get. And it's angry because at. you grew up here, like you're American. Like I, if, if this is the I like to say it like this because Northern Ireland's a tiny place, right? But in Northern Ireland, 
it, when growing up there in the midst of the troubles, it was like that was everything. That was a massive conflict between Catholics and Protestants. If you came to Ireland, you'd be like, what is this about? Who cares? Right? Yeah. yeah. So in the same way, and you're drawn in more, and I feel drawn in because I've lived here for eight years on and off, but it's, it is easier for me to kind of also try not to get drawn in. Yeah. But how can you not? Because you grew up in this country. I know, but you're doing a great job because you're no fun to text these things to. <laughs> I know. You really are. <laughs> Sorry. You're so boring with it because you don't care. And I'm like, Pete doesn't care, but I don't have anybody else to screw to vomit this crap <laughs> at. So, Did you see Pete? And you're like, oh, that's crazy. Anyway, what do you want to do? Uh, it's very fun. It's maybe a very healthy thing. Um, all right. Well, what do you say? We Yeah, that was fun. Um, uh, hopefully, we, will we be canceled for this? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. How? Well, uh, yeah, but we, <laughs> we're not really getting paid for this anyway. I'm pretty upset about that one-star review. I'll tell you that. So yeah. if you guys could leave us some five-star <laughs> reviews, you can tell us we're canceled. And it is yeah. fun. You can say anything you want. Terrible. Just give us the five stars. Uh, when it's you all set. fun yeah. ways of looking at things, and yeah. you see the irony. And it's uh, At the end of the day, I do think we have an, a... a at our core with what we do with the podcast, there is a desire to invite everyone in to uh, the conversation in a way that doesn't make anybody a scapegoat that is the entire problem. And you know what? I'm, I, I'm yeah. worse about that than you are. You're much better about being like, every this is all whatever. I'm getting there, but it takes a little yeah. bit of time. I can but I it. believe in this. And I got a bit depressed, to be honest, because I looked at some podcasts recently and saw, saw how popular they were and didn't think they were very good. And I was I like, know. no, we have to do this. We have to keep going and you know so all right this is our season finale everybody we'll see you in (laughs) three months yeah every time we say we're going to keep going that's when we stop i know like don't talk about that we're we got a good thing going right now we've done like four in a row all right bye everybody thank you bye bye